Welcome to PDMA Corporation, home of the MC event. I'd like to thank you for joining us as we continue along in our presentation series. Once again, I have the Vice President of Product Development, Mr. Noah Bethel. Hello from sunny Tampa, Florida. And I am Todd Gunderson, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing. And Noah, the title speaks for itself, multiple, pro multiple problems in an induction motor. What? One is bad, but uh, two is worse. Right, so we're going to be able to show the overall comprehensiveness of getting a lot of data and, and breaking it down. So without further ado, let's get into the actual asset we're going to be testing here, and it's a scrubber research pump. Interesting. Not a very big motor either. No, it's only 20 horsepower, two poles, but scrubber... Uh, once you hear that, that's uh, once you hear that, that's definitely in the environmental area. Oh yeah, yeah. As far in terms of uh, scrubbing the pollutants out, that becomes a pretty important deal to, especially the environmentalists. Absolutely. Yeah, and so as you can see here on some of the uh, right up here, if you have one is the main, uh, but if you need additional flow, um, then uh, you're going to have to bring in number two as it's the backup. Unfortunately, you can see here from the timeline, we've had seven failures in 12 years for this asset. Which is just an unacceptable failure rate. Uh, any motor uh, design, you would think, you know, the general goal would be 15 to 20 years. And if you get 10, you feel good about it. Every couple years failing is, is something has to be done. And the cost isn't that, e it's not that extreme, $3,000, it's, it's not that extreme, yes it is a lot of money, however, 16 man hours for replacement, maybe some downtime. Oh, that the, could be yeah, the production losses, like I said, if you're losing scrubber, you're not going to be able to pollute the environment, so you're going to have to shut the system down. Uh, loss of production could be big. Right, so there's a reason why you want to get this solved. So here's a picture of the motor itself, and there's some things that jump out at me. I don't know what you want to describe about it. This motor lives in a very industrious environment. <laughs> All right. It's seen its better days. Even though it's probably a fairly new motor, it's definitely gone through uh, some difficult times, and we see a lot of water. There is a lot of water, yeah. That, and water and electricity generally aren't uh, considered friends, and so that, that, that is certainly something they need to look into. Yep, and we have quite a few case studies on why water and moisture don't mix with electrical, and we show the, uh, the aftermath of that. So here's the picture of the motor. Now, this is some test data that we collected on this, and there's two things that really jump out at us. Yeah, I mean, j we always say, you know, red needs to be looked at, and there's plenty of red on this history chart. Uh, first of all, we got the corrected resistance to ground, which is our the fault zone we always refer to as insulation. Um, and then we've got the resistive imbalance, which is the, you know, 92% is, is just out out of the... It's extreme. It's very, very high. And, and that's our power circuit fault zone that we focus on. Okay, so we have two pathways to go down. And we're going to go after the high resistance uh, connection first. And so here's uh, the data that presented itself at uh, 92%. So this is when we initially find the data. And then what they do, this is how you do troubleshooting. You, uh, you divide and conquer, right? Absolutely. And you can see from the test location, we're going from the T leads, which is at the starter. And then we're isolating the motor and testing it by itself. And, and you can see that the numbers change dramatically uh, to the better. Well, it cleared it, right? So we test at the motor, it's fine. So we know the motor's good. The motor power circuit wise is nicely balanced phase to phase, yes. Okay, so the next step would be to go to power circuit and then once you tie it all together, right, so you put the motor back in with the power circuit, you figure maybe there was some corrosion on the uh, uh, the Clean motor connection the leads. Or the, the, right, the connections, absolutely. Tighten everything up, but we're still at 14.47. Still so. unacceptable. Anything, I mean, you start to see in values for a motor only over 1%, it's not good. With the power circuit, 2 and 3 is not unusual in low-voltage environments. 14, absolutely unacceptable. So they did some more investigative research, and here's what they found. Uh, the terminal strip was faulty, and they had some loose connections there. Wow, look at that. You can see where the actual connectivity was occurring. You know, it looks like less than 10% might have actually been connected and conducting current through this, through this terminal block. So there was the main culprit. So that's one. We figured out why the... Uh, good troubleshooting. Yeah, good troubleshooting event here. Why was it... Uh, 
giving a high resistance connection. Now let's go on to number two, resistance to ground. Why is it so low? Yeah, 1.6 measured. Uh, again, that's going to be at room temperature, the temperature at one collect when the data was collected. The IEEE 43 always wants to temperature correct that because as you heat the motor up, the insulation and resistance to ground is going to be lower at operational temperatures, and it just drops way low uh, below the, the standards of around 5 meg, and in this situation, it's just unacceptably low. So remember the picture before. We had a lot of water. It was even on the base plate, the concrete slab that's right, there. Right, there was a lot of water. A lot of water around, so let's do some research on that. Uh, before that, we went and did a polarization index test, and, and we saw some yellow on there, but look at the value of the profile. Yeah, usually you still, even in a, in a degraded scenario, you see a little bit of, a, of an ele you know, a, r a slow rise in resistance to ground over time. In this situation, it started low and actually got lower. And when you start to see values of polarization index, you know, which is a 10 minute divided by the one minute reading of less than one, the severity goes way high. So now we really want to increase our investigative approach on this. And look at this picture here. This actually is right directly above. This is on the fourth floor of the facility. The motor that was in that had the low resistance ground was directly below it. Now we're going to point out some things on this screen here. We've got a drain here, uh, but we had a, a look like a dike was there to pull up to block the mo the water from going into this area because. There's an actual hole right here that uh, that drains down to the third floor. Oh boy! Right over the motor of concern. Right over the motor of concern. So Scrubbers below. Yeah. Well, it was catching all the oil and and water from above was falling directly below that. Wow! And this is obviously a common washdown area, like you said. So all this water is designed to go to that drain, but unfortunately, you got to ask why did that barrier get removed? Because if water's passing right past that barrier and then dropping down on the scrubbers. This is an ongoing problem. Yes. And so what they decided to do was, well, rather than put a, a, a dike in there, they're just going to put some foam in that area to prevent the water from seeping down to the third floor. Right. Even if it goes over the barrier, you're saying no more access to the scrubber region from upstairs. So, no, we're going to, so we found both issues. What do you think uh, was the more dominant issue, or was there a dominant issue? You know, we in our presentations that we talk about fault zone analysis, we try to emphasize the importance of each fault zone. And I think in this situation, you could blame either one for either one of those 12 failures that occurred in the very short period of time. And rather than, than maybe saying one was more likely than the other, either one, I think, uh, is likely responsible for one or more of those failures, and it's good that they, you know, are utilizing the overall fault zone approach to, to clear all the fault zones before moving forward. So in this case, it's always good to have a comprehensive tool with you that can test the motor when it's running or whether it's shut down and give you valuable information. Absolutely. You mentioned, you know, running tests, you know, that power circuit anomaly. If we had a, uh, an associated current imbalance measurement or a current reading, we would know exactly the, the severity level of a power circuit anomaly and its effect on the operation of the motor with an online test from our Emacs technology. All right. Well, thank you for that. And we're at the end of this presentation. And we thank you for your attendance and, and listening in for us and as always if you have any comments or you have a, a case study that you'd like to share with the group we'd be more than happy to take a look at it until then you stay safe out there and thank you very much